Welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Oye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies through conversations with senior leaders who share their unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Mr. Tan Rasab, CEO and co-founder of Cygenics a startup health technology company that is leveraging artificial intelligence or AI as an innovative platform to enable personalized clinical genetic testing for everyone, everywhere. Tan has founded two startups over the last 25 years while also working with other startups, multinationals, and public sector organizations in strategy consulting, technology, health, energy, and in three continents. Tan and I connected on LinkedIn and bonded over our shared love of the name Sophia. Fun fact, his daughter's name is also Sophia. I admire the bravery of a serial entrepreneur and look forward to learning more insights about his third startup, Cygenics. Welcome to the show, Tan. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in your drive to you know, to increase the message about uh, health and health services? Uh, it's my absolute pleasure. It's, uh, it's fun to connect on this uh, platform. So my first question is my favorite, <laughs> and it's uh, an opportunity for you to just share your honest definition of what you think scientific innovation is. So what is your definition of scientific innovation? Well, somebody who's not from the life sciences industry as an outsider, uh, anything for me that you know uh, sheds new light on existing you know existing uh, uh, state of being whether it's material science whether it's life sciences whether it's astronomy or quantum mechanics anything which helps us to understand you know who we are mm -hmm. uh, what we do where we come from and what is out there right. you know, it, since the, 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 the dawn of you know, mankind, when he must have looked at the sky and then looked down, he probably had questions, or he or she had questions <laughs> on, on, you know, who am I? You know, what is this about? And why does this happen? And why does this not happen? Mm -hmm. So I think this sense of curiosity uh, is what has led innovation. And if you just look back, mm. you know, from the day you know, from what, when we, you and I probably studied the school of Pythagoras and uh, right. the Greeks, you know, scientific, and then led by the, uh, the Arab uh, scholars who then helped inspire Renaissance in Italy and Venice in Europe, how, uh, you know, things have evolved, you know, mm -hmm. maybe four or 500 years ago, electricity was seen as magic. Right. You know, many things that we take for granted. Just what we're doing now. I'm sitting yeah. in Cambridge, you're in New York. <laughs> I can see you, you can see me and we can talk. 200 years ago, that would have been seen as sorcery. Yeah. You know? So I think there are certain things that exist and innovation helps us to understand, uh, scientific discoveries help us to understand things better. You know, mm. on, you know the answers we seek to. And then the people who find those answers are able to translate those science, scientific discoveries into innovation, which has a Im daily impact on us. You know, whether it's, you know, you and I talking on this phone or whether I switch on my microwave to warm up uh, the curry that my mother gave me yesterday, uh, <laughs> you know, to heat up when it takes, what, one minute in, instead of 25 minutes or 30 minutes. So a lot of things I think have been you know, a sense of curiosity which somebody had, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a, a junior scientist or, a, you know, or an astrophysicist or somebody sitting at their desk pondering why things are done this way and why not that way. Right. So innovation and scientific discovery are, I think, a natural being of mankind. It's something that we as humans have the sense 
to discover why things happen and uh, what happens. Well, what I love about your definition is that it emphasizes two things. One is continuity, right? Uh, the innovation is just, it's not a one-time process, it's a continuous process. And you also recognize curiosity as being the driver for that continuity. So I, I really like how, how you define that. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so my next question is, personal or it could be professional but what would you consider to be your most significant um, scientific or professional accomplishment to date? Um, what I like about you as I mentioned in the introduction is how you've gone through so many different industries and I'm sure you have nuggets of, of knowledge that you've gained from that sort of exposure so can you tell me what you would think the one thing that you think is the most significant achievement? I think it's, a, it's actually a personal achievement rather than any numerical achievement, whether in, you know, in the company I created, who I worked for. And the personal achievement is that when I was younger, uh, I had a lot of curiosity, but I didn't have the patience. Mm. I was too eager to do things. And over the last 20 years, working with some you know, amazing people in Asia, in the US, uh, in England, India, the Middle East, and so on, uh, and Pakistan as well, and, and so on, is th this, you know, a lot of people have taken, you know, significant amount of time mm -hmm. to understand subjects. And what mm -hmm. I learned was learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. That was my personal innovation, my personal mm -hmm. achievement, is that if I seek an answer to something, mm -hmm. I've learned how to find the information, mm -hmm. how to assess it, how to review it. And I think that's my personal, achievement I would say that I have wow. you know, the last 20 years is uh, you know when I was a teenager or uh, or uh, uh, an adult in my early 20s I, right. I was eager to you know to, to revolutionize the world and make instant changes and over a period of time I have learned to understood that you know to do that you need a lot of information and you need to have a lot of understanding and to gain that understanding is a skill to gain the information is a skill. So learning how to learn is something I think we should all be taught. And I think once you have this pure joy of learning, you know, when, when right. I read some papers in early in the morning, I wake up typically 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I start reading all the latest discoveries. And some of them probably seem very obvious, but somebody thought about it, learned how to, you know, do the experiment and then conclude. So learning to learn and understanding where to get the information and how to interpret that information i think is one of the best skills to have and it's something that all students all kids should be taught before even learning you know physics and uh, quadratic equations and uh, right. uh, you know how, how magellan circumnavigated the world we should be taught how to learn you know how, how to learn and how to actually process information and how to understand different things. And I wow. think that is not done at the moment. So that I would say is my personal achievement at the age of now, you know, just over 50. Ooh, okay. I, I, have this pleasure. <laughs> um, I have this pleasure. I feel like a, a student, you know, uh, that sits in the all day in the library, you know, with wonderful books. Now all the books are available at my fingertip, you know, right. it's a phone or my laptop. And it's a great age to be in where you have access to this amazing information you know, you're an expert in your field uh, and many of the people that you're talking to will impart a lot of words that I, as a novice, can learn, you know, about the health and medical industry. So that, I would say, is the, my personal achievement, is the ability to literally sit and read hundreds of papers. And over the last few years, my colleague and I, we must have reviewed over five, 6,000 papers specifically wow. on the role of genetics and uh, how, you know, how diagnostics are done and what uses they have and where their pitfalls are and where, uh, where opportunities lie. So that I think is my personal achievement, uh, apart from you know, bringing up two daughters, which is, which is <laughs> an amazing achievement as well. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think this is brilliant. Learning how to learn. Although I was gonna say, although their mother probably serves more of the credit than I do. <laughs> 
I believe it's a two-way street, but, but that's nice. I, I appreciate that. But what I, I love about what you said is we're building on a theme here. We started out by your definition of science innovation, and it was about continuity and curiosity. Now you talk about patience being a key ingredient and that diligence to learn how to learn. I think that that's fascinating. So thank you for building on, on a great story already. So are thank you ready for my third question? Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. So considering your career in, in diverse industries, including technology, health, telecommunications, and energy, what inspired you to work on your third startup, Cygenix? So Cygenix came out of two, two particular uh, reasons. One hmm. is that the male side of my family, my siblings, and some hmm. of my cousins and other relatives, we have an issue with our digestive system. We have a mm. genetic mutation, which basically at some point in our lives, we will probably experience inflammation of the colon and specifically mm. left side ulcerative colitis. So my younger siblings, my, my immediate younger brother had his bowel removed and, and the one younger than wow. him has uh, immunosuppressants. And I know that, you know, my daughters will have probably have may have that issue. And I know some of the other, my nieces and nephews have some of these issues as well. So uh, that was one reason. I wanted to understand how to help mm. people manage their chronic illnesses without resorting to you know, lots of uh, drastic therapies, uh, right. you know, immunosuppressants or surgery and so on. So by actually enabling them to understand how their body is responding to certain foods and if they change their behavior, we mm -hmm. can give them some sort of feedback mechanism. Mm -hmm. So that was one driver is to understand how to build a service. Mm -hmm. So my co-founder and I, we started a company which actually is in the UK is still called Nutrisim Labs Limited. Uh, mm -hmm. And the idea was to help people to understand, you know, we would do their, uh, we would do a genetic test by taking their stool sample understanding the biome, which is, you know, obviously affects your colon and digestive system. Uh, mm -hmm. And then at the same time, look at the epigenetic profile of intestinal cells. Mm -hmm. And by extracting the intestinal cells, we can understand where the expression levels are for certain proteins. You know, is your, are your intestinal cells sending the right signals to your liver, to your, uh, to your, uh, uh, to your kidneys, to your, mm -hmm pancreas, gallbladder mm -hmm. to produce the proteins or the enzymes needed to break down the food. And as we know, there's certain people have intolerances to lactose, others have intolerances to wheat and peanuts and many other foods. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a company which would offer a personalized intervention service for people that you know, have these illnesses. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, most of the people who have these illnesses tend to be from, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the lower income brackets yeah. in the world because simply they don't have access, you know, to the healthy food. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have access to fresh food. Uh, mm -hmm. They tend to buy prepackaged processed food. Plus, in a lot of demographics, there is a high uh, consumption of alcohol and not mm -hmm. just wine or light beers, it tends to be hot liquor. Right. And of course, the other factor is smoking. So in all these societies, smoking nowadays seems to be linked to people with lower income, you know, uh, lower income uh, echelons of society. Uh, you know, in, in here we call them working class. In the US, you would call them, uh, you know, the, the, the blue collar workers. Socially economically disadvantaged, right. Yes. So right. they, tend to, they tend to have cardiovascular diseases. They yeah. tend to have a higher incidence of obesity and diabetes. And then yeah. you have a further complication for these poor people. You know, they suffer from chronic painful illnesses. And mm -hmm. uh, specifically, you know, ulcerative colitis can, you know, increase inflammatory arthritis, spondylitis, which basically, you know, really painful for joints and knees and, insomnia and fogginess and migraines and so on. So, you know, we wanted to create a service which we, we found some experts that would help us create a tailor-made program using mm -hmm. some AI and genetic testing to come up with a personalized plan. And then by mm -hmm. doing regular testing, we can give them feedback on how mm -hmm. 
their bodies responding to the changes they have adopted. And this is not just conventional you know, lab chemistry tests, it would be specifically genetic expressions and see how the gene expressions are changing based on the changes they have adopted. So we thought this would be a gold standard. So we built, we designed the app, we built you know, a, a, a sort of a pre-prototype to test and then we approached laboratories to see how we can get the testing done. Mm-hmm. And it was shocking. You know, the costs were prohibitively high, ranging mm-hmm. from uh, $600 to as much as $2,000 per test. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then secondly, the time to results, you know, with a full analysis report could take as much as two months. So I thought this couldn't work. You know, the, 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 the guy in, 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 a, in the middle of, uh, you know, Louisiana or, or mm-hmm. uh, Brooklyn or, uh, you know, Harlem mm-hmm. and in the UK, some of the disadvantaged areas, is not going to be able to afford these tests. So how do we make right. it cheaper? So I approached Illumina, a mm. uh, gentleman called uh, Bobby Cora, and mm-hmm. uh, they called Tiffany Morris and some of their colleagues, and they said, well, you know, you can actually build your own lab if you want to s- speed things up and you could perhaps use robotic hand- liquid handling systems to actually do the processing. So when we started the evaluation, uh, my colleague and I, my co-founder, who had previously created a number of devices, we thought actually if we make everything into a single box and automate the functions, this has more implications to than what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. This has a lot more uh, you know, <clears throat> applications in, in, in a lot of countries. And our idea then blossomed from that original idea, pivoted to create this lab and instead of you know, handing out a microscope, expensive, sophisticated microscope, which gets used for a month, and then when something goes wrong, it gets put into a cupboard, which happens in a lot of developing countries in low resource right. areas. Right. We wanted to create a complete solution. So we provide mm-hmm. a sample collection device, which mm-hmm. attaches to a, a butterfly syringe. And the other side is you have a fully reviewed, uh, uh, report, personalized report, which basically mm-hmm reviews the genotype, phenotype, plus the, the mutations, matches them to previous clinical studies and research papers, extracts the recommendations, and then generates report. That report then is reviewed by a network of what I would call, they're not genetic counselors, they are domain experts. So these would be people, for example, who understand newborn screening and, and certain mm-hmm. diseases. So maybe autism, maybe Down syndrome, Mm-hmm. PKU and so on. On the other side, you might have someone who's a, uh, you know, a breast, breast cancer oncologist who understands cancer, women's issues, and genetics. So these people can review the, the reports that our system generates together with the genetic data that we have sequenced and matched to known mutations and match those new, known mutations to diseases identify past clinical studies and reports and case studies that match the profile of the patient and the and and the and the the the, 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 the you know the genetic data the genotype data and then that report is sent to a human reviewer whose job is to review and make recommendations and that report is then sent to the clinician so why would we wanted to do this it's great if we have access to the Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins and you know, Cedar sinai or Adam Brooks in, in Cambridge in the UK, we have a ton of experts. But imagine if you're you know, in the middle of Kenya, a small little town where we are able to do this test. You know, are they going to have all the capabilities to do the analytics? Are they going to have mm-hmm. the capabilities to do you know, recommendation of potential therapies that may work for that patient? So the clinician will have data plus guidance from experts to be able to make a much more informed decision. And I think that kind of solution is what the world needs. Right now, only 20 20 countries have any kind of national genetic testing infrastructure. Wow. 20 countries. And I posted this on LinkedIn. If you see the map, it's, it's basically a club of wealthy countries. Yes, yes. That's it. Mm-hmm. In India, you have, you know, 1.4 billion people, 26 million babies born per year. 
and less than, I would say, you know, a few percentage points are screened for newborn disease, you know, newborn uh, diseases or maternal diseases, inherited diseases. And there are roughly 20, 25 genetic testing labs. So it means that only people who can afford it and people who have insurance cover will be able to have these tests. The rest right. don't. So our mission is to provide a solution which can be used even by a district nurse, you know, in the, uh, who works probably in a number of villages. She can collect the sample, bring them to the, to the small little city hospital, and they can do the testing on site without having to send samples over to a lab in Italy or Amsterdam or UK or California. They can have the tests analyzed, the sample is kept in the country, the data is kept in the country, the patient's privacy is you know, uh, 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 honored, and then only the, the, the vital key data that is needed to make an assessment goes to our system that, that matches to the past clinical studies and then to the human reviewers who make a recommendation. So we think this way we can actually provide a solution, you know, a sample to answer solution rather than, you know, pieces of equipment which requires uh, setting up, right. which requires, uh, you know, dedicated facilities, for example, in genetic testing, you know, when you prepare the sample, you, 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 you know, your ampli amplification room needs to be separate from PCR room. And then you need almost like a clean room environment with trained lab technicians and very expensive equipment. Uh, and then you need experts who need to analyze all this. So we thought, you know, how can we make this simpler? How do we make the iPhone of genetic mm -hmm. testing? Mm -hmm. Where most of the technology is behind the screen, you know, mm -hmm. and all we need to do is to input a sample in a cartridge and the rest is done by the machine. And this way we can reduce testing times for certain tests from days to few hours and from months to two or three days. Wow. And at significantly lower cost. Wow. You know, we estimate that to set up uh, a clinical genetic testing lab with the equipment that we're developing will be a thousand percent less than a similar, uh, you know, lab setting up disparate equipment from different suppliers. Wow. So I think that your mission is powerful. So from our discussion, I understand that SI, the SI is silicon, the genetics part is it's a play on, on genetics. And your yes. powerful mission is to enable personalized clinical um, testing for everyone so that you can get your genetics screened far in advance. And to the point you made earlier, it shouldn't just be for the wealthiest 20 countries, but how do you enable people from India or people from Africa to make sure that they get the same quality of and, and access to clinical testing? So I think that that's, that is powerful. So uh, do you have anything else to share about science? Sophia, if you look at, you know, I'm, I'm using my iPhone, right? Yes. Which was developed in California, manufactured in Taiwan, with lots of components in, you know? Yeah. And with this iPhone, I can have access to anything in the world. I can get banking. I can talk to you. I can look at maps. I can look at weather reports. I can look at news. I can use Google, Wikipedia, literally to have access to the whole world. Right? But it was the fact that this device was made very simple to use is why mm -hmm. a lot of Luddites and you know, anti-technologists are able to use it as well without mm -hmm. much training. You can take it out of the box, plug it in, you know, enter your details, and within a f probably, what, 10, 15 minutes, it's operational. Why mm -hmm. can't we do that with other technologies that can actually make, you know, uh, basically help mankind, help society. And, and, you know, health is one of the biggest challenges as Absolutely. populations grow, mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, you know, income uh, uh, increases, as industrialization increases around the world. Uh, you know, in, in some cases, for example, West Africa, you have higher cases of obesity in, in uh, middle, you know, 
women in their 30s because they are now making everything using machines at home and they're getting the food from supermarkets and their maid does all the cooking and it's all very simple. <laughs> Whereas 15, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. they would have to probably, you know, ground the flour themselves and spend a good few hours preparing. So now you have obesity, you have diabetes, all, all these modern wealthy nation chronic illnesses, you know, moving on to the developing world. The developed world has moved on to that because government programs and, you know, experts and people like yourself who advocate healthy lifestyles and healthy eating and exercise and, you know, it's hammered into us, you know, and reduce smoking and, and so on. Whereas in those countries, they are just experiencing now, you know, uh, urbanization. People are moving from rural areas to urban centers. They're living in smaller places. They tend to have less exercise. And, uh, you know, the quality of the food they're getting is much more, you know, limited. It, it, it's, it's, it's less diverse. So we think there is going to be a lot more illnesses. And then if you look at other factors in, in many tribal and many sort of uh, societies, the marriages are between families. Mm -hmm. The gene pools are smaller. So if there is a mutation that was, you know, a genetic disease was carried by an ancestor, mm -hmm. you know, a great, great grandfather, it's probably spread to a number of people. And then, as you know, there are lots of second cousin marriages in, in right. a lot of parts of the world. So when they get married, there's a high chance of both being carriers. So I think, you know, having prenatal testing, and I even, perhaps I will sound controversial now, but I, I would say <laughs> pre-marriage testing, mm. you know, before a couple decide to date, when they're seriously considering they should have a test, you know, and I, and I, and I do acknowledge there's a moral issue there as well. But these are sort of things that we can do to help people to to have healthier children, to have, you know, happier children who can grow like everybody else. Uh, you know, I think in India, uh, all deaths, mm -hmm. you know, infant mortality is 20% of those deaths are related to inherited genetic diseases. And if they mm -hmm. were treated, you know, from the time of birth or even during conception, you know, the outcomes could have been different. So. Yeah. If our machines, if our labs can save just a, you know, just one life, and that would be an amazing achievement. That would be the next achievement for myself is that having seen the equipment that we envisage and then in a few years time being delivered in a remote location and seeing the results, how they are used to, you know, to save lives and to treat people with illnesses. And I think that would be a, probably the achievement, you know, to, to, to remember by. Oh, that's wonderful. So thank you for sharing those insights. They're not controversial, they're just your opinion. People don't always have to agree, but you have the freedom to express what you think. Um, so I, I think I might have an idea since you alluded to it earlier, but can you tell me of any technology or company, including yours, that you're currently excited about? Other companies, I, I, I mean, you know, every day there are biomarkers <laughs> coming out, right? There's researchers, and I'm obsessed about these because every day there's a new report there, identify biomarkers, genetic mm -hmm. biomarkers for illnesses. And I think this is the start of the revolution of personalized medicine. So this mm -hmm. is the most exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. AI, you know, is, is very sexy right now. Drug discovery, diagnosis, remote health. Uh, for me, you know, AI is, it, 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 it's for people that, you know, have much more mathematical and complex mm. understanding. Mm. So I, I, we, get, we get experts who have, and I think that would make a, a change. And in many cases, I've seen reports where the AI diagnosis for certain image-based, you know, medicines, such as radiography, CTI scans, mm -hmm. you know, mammography, AI is able to do a better job than some of the clinicians. Mm, mm. And I think it will be a combination of a clinician and an AI that will be what will happen. I don't think you know, the clinicians 
shouldn't worry. They're not going to be out of a job anytime <laughs> soon. Uh, but it will make their life easier and mm -hmm. it, will be able, it will help them to serve more patients than they mm -hmm. would normally do. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this information is then you know, shared across the world. You know? So if, if we find a particular you know, a case and, and there are other cases around the world, that sharing of information, I think, is going to be extremely powerful. As I said at the beginning, you know, a, a small village hospital in the middle of Kenya is going to have the same access to computing power and knowledge than as John Hopkins or some of the world's leading ho research hospitals. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for sharing those insights. So this is going to be my second to last question for you. Okay. Um, you ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So thinking broadly, what do you think are some key consideration factors that will help to sustain innovation in the health technology space? Well, one of the things that COVID has done, it has directed interest from investors to health and health technology. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of new models on how do you provide health services, mm -hmm. you know, from micro hospitals to on-site testing, to having AI and, you know, AI sort of hybrid AI analysis and telehealth. So a lot of these things that we thought of were possible, you know, in the last five, 10 years ago or even longer are now being actioned and deployed in the last six months. And, and I think they will be continued to be deployed mm -hmm. post COVID. So there will be a post COVID world where mm -hmm. a lot of these technologies will be in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, you know, that's one of the, the development which is positive and which needs to increase is funding available for new out of box ideas, the moonshots, you know, uh, and that is high risk capital, so governments need to be involved mm -hmm. and uh, decision making processes need to be faster as 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 covid has shown uh, and uh, the other thing I think we need is is a collective collective you know sharing of information, mm -hmm. research, and discoveries you know mm -hmm. we, we need we are connected in mm -hmm. the world, and you know siloing and compartmentalizing and hiding you know, health research, I think, is unforgivable. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be able to share information. You know, mm -hmm. if we have discoveries which give insight, which may save lives in another part of the world, that should be shared. And, and, and most scientists and researchers are very active in that. So I think this is, you know, so you have sharing of information and you have mm -hmm. access to high-risk capital. And I would you know, I, I'm about to say another controversial thing, but I think <laughs> the U.S. arguably is the best place for that. Mm. You know, you, you have a lot of investors who and foundations and government organizations and VCs who understand by investing in ideas is how they're going to have gigantic returns. You know, if the company's already tested the idea and it's it's ready to sell, you know, the chance for them to make those you know, 20x returns are not going to happen. Whereas if they can assess and take a, take a gamble on some innovative new ideas, uh, you know, that may be changing, you know, world changing and, 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 and have a major impact as well as become very profitable, they need to provide a funding and, uh, you know, at an earlier stage where I think in some, many countries that is not possible. Right. You, know, you have to have a patent, you have to have some sort of demonstration before you get external investors. And my understanding of you know, the, 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 the investor scene in Greater New York, uh, Massachusetts, and of course, you know, uh, Bay Area and Southern California is the VCs and the investors. And sometimes they're from existing companies that they launched 20 years ago. They want to reinvest. So I think the U.S., and particularly those areas I mentioned, will continue to be a magnet mm -hmm. for the rebels and, for, you know, what Steve Jobs said, the out-of-box thinkers, you know, the ones who don't accept things and who want to make a change. They will always find a home in those areas I mentioned. So the rest of the world needs to learn 
from Massachusetts, from New York, you know, and from Silicon Valley and Southern California, you know, the secret source. And the secret source is, you know, uh, what I call adventure capital, you know, provide, mm -hmm. you know, uh, risk capital, provide mentoring, provide support, and build on ecosystems. Wonderful. And these ecosystems teach us to learn how to learn, just as you yes. mentioned earlier. Yes. That's also a key ingredient. Yes, and one final point, you know, the U.S. Is, tolerates failure. It encourages mm. failure. So mm -hmm. failure is seen as a, as a kudos, you know, a mm -hmm. badge of honor. Can you imagine that in many other countries? If you lose no. your investment money, you better yeah. run away. You better leave the country, you know? Yeah. In, in some countries, they ask you for guarantees. Yeah. 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 So I think that, 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 needs to, that mindset has to change. And it's the role of government officials. And in many of these, you know, African, Latin American, Asia countries, you have highly educated mm -hmm. young uh, bureaucrats in positions of power, politicians, who have the capability, who have the power mm -hmm. to make these changes. We mm -hmm. just need to encourage them to make those changes. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And so my final question is very simple. The floor is yours. Do you have any other comment, uh, commentary or thoughts, anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up today? I would say all those people sitting in their bedrooms and working from home, you know, hang on there, hang in there. You know, use the time to learn, use the time to connect. I mean, many days I, I, I sit through three or four conferences, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Berlin, you know, New York and uh, Boston at the same time. And that would never have been possible pre-COVID. I wouldn't have had the privilege of probably meeting you, you know, having this interview with, with you. Yeah. And I wouldn't have had the privilege and the honor of meeting some great people uh, through these, you know, virtual conferences and webinars. And I wouldn't have been able to access these webinars. Yeah. You know, there would have been restricted yeah. meetings that I would have never heard of. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, one day I can listen to the Terasaki Institute, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Illumina events, you know, Thermo Fisher events, all these companies that have webinars every day, you know, and, 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 and they're of interest to me and my colleagues, we can attend them. And, and, and I think that is my message is, you know, don't be despondent. I know that a lot of you are sitting at home, really getting fed up of being working at home uh, every day and, you know, not being able to venture out, not being able to meet and interact with people because, you know, this business is all about people. It's all about interacting and learning. And although, you know, Zoom does not beat face to face, <laughs> it allows us to have some continuity. Yeah. So that is the, the, the key message I would like to send to all my colleagues and, and fellow entrepreneurs and researchers who are working hard, in, in, you know, in their basements, in their lofts, in their bedrooms, on their kitchen tables, uh, you know, going through this uh, repeat cycle. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like a Groundhog Day film. <laughs> that never <laughs> ends. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I hope with all our, you know, with our friends who are developing the, the therapies and the vaccines that uh, and uh, those will be, you know, effective. And within the next six months or 12 months, you know, things can slowly get back to normal. Oh, this is great. Thank you for taking us through the story of the importance of continuity, curiosity, patience, resilience, and that core ingredient of men and how to learn. Even in a very difficult setting, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, it's just been incredibly refreshing just, you know, having this conversation with you. So thank you for oh, that. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and I look forward to... Uh, you know, listening and watching some of the other people that you've invited and once you actually have made the recordings available to everyone. Wonderful. It should be a great season. So thank you for being a guest and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Take care. Right,